there is also just like very explicit abuse and human rights violations during the show as well. And we're talking, you know, I've had conversations with people who will, of course, remain anonymous, but sexual assault, physical battery. Um, we're talking like the worst kinds of physical and mental harm being inflicted, sometimes deliberately. Are you going through life blind? This is Eyes Wide Open with Nick Thompson. On this podcast, we share knowledge and stories that build human connection while elevating stigmatized societal issues such as mental health, holistic wellness, culture, free speech, and more. All to ensure we show up in the world with our eyes wide open. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of Eyes Wide Open. Today, we are going to be talking about the real behind the scenes of reality TV. Um, we'll be talking about some of the experiences, again, that I've had on Love is Blind um, with Jeremy Hartwell and Dr. Isabel Morley, who are the other co-founding members of the UCAN Foundation. So we're going to talk today about some of the psychological warfare that was going on throughout filming from the perspective of a clinical psychologist. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the labor challenges and um, you know, lack of access to food and water. But ultimately, what we're going to be doing today is talking through why all of our experiences have led us to start the UCAN Foundation and what we're trying to accomplish with that. So I hope you enjoy this. I hope you come in with an open mind and an open heart uh, to understand the real reason why this is important so that we can all leave this conversation today with our eyes wide open about what's actually going on behind the scenes of reality TV. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode. Today, we have two guests. First, we have Dr. Isabel Morley, who's a licensed clinical psychologist and co-founding board member and director of mental health for the Unscripted Cast Advocacy Network, or the UCAN Foundation. And we have Jeremy Hartwell, who's a performance coach and consultant and co-founder and executive of executive director of the UCAN Foundation. And what is the UCAN Foundation, if you haven't heard? We uh, provide mental health support to past, current, and future reality TV stars. And then full disclosure, I'm a third co-founder of the UCAN Foundation, and I am the um, executive director of Outreach. So we're here today to talk about the formation of the organization, why it exists, why it's important, and how we all came together to push for this change. But I just wanted to disclose to all of you that we are working together on this foundation. So thank you guys for coming on the show. How are we doing today? Good. Doing good. Excited to be here. Doing great, good. Nick. Thanks. Awesome. Well, we've all talked a lot, so I figured some of our conversations should be shared with um, with the audience. So first thing I want to do, though, before we get into why we're all here, my favorite question to ask people is, what did you want to be when you were growing up? And how did that change over the years to where you are now? And why don't we start with um, Dr. Isabel? Ooh, I'm feeling very self-conscious about answering this question, which I should probably think about why that is. I wanted to be an actress. I was like dead set on being an actress, which is one of the ones you said everybody says. Um, I can't even tell you why, because I get stage fright. It's like not a skill of mine, but I think I like the idea of being able to perform and have confidence. And then over time, I think I recognized it was just not a talent that I had. Um, and then after that, I pretty quickly wanted to become a therapist and just walked that path right through until I became a therapist. So when you were when you were wanting to be an actress, did you try any theater or participate in any type of performing arts? Only within the school setting, like at my schools, I was in plays and stuff, but I didn't actually pursue it outside of that. I think it was just uh a far-fetched dream that I sort of hoped would pan out without any intervention on my part, which surprisingly <laughs> didn't happen. So here I am now. What was your fav favorite performance that you did? Oh, God. I, I we haven't I was, even gotten to the hard-hitting questions yet. This is the hardest part of this for me. I mean, I don't think I was even in that many plays where I could remember one where I could say that it went well. I guess Annie. I was an orphan in Annie, and I think that went well. <laughs> I did some theater too. And I always tried to do like the a student director role because I was more of a behind, believe it or not, more of a behind the camera kind of person. But I can relate like it's my favorite was the crucible and I played one of the G men. So I had one one or two lines and I was on for like 45 seconds tops and 
not G men. What was I saying? I was the sheriff. That was a different play. I was a G man. I was the sheriff. So I actually did have a big role. That was my favorite one. But other so than you that, play it was authority like, figures. I do. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> but Jeremy, what about you? Yeah. Um, and I, I just want to comment on Isabel's answer there. I think in some parallel universe, you did pursue that dream, Isabel, and you also wound up still as a founding board member of the UCAN Foundation, but this time from a uh, <laughs> from an actor's perspective. So I think whichever path you chose in quantum mechanics and parallel universes, you wound up here, I think. Well, I think there's probably then a third parallel universe where she went on a reality show and still... Wow ended up here as a founding board member of the You Can Foundation. That could You're still stuck. Happen. I could still go on a reality TV show. I'm sure they would all want me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we haven't burned those bridges. Um, <laughs> yeah, I actually wanted to be a fighter pilot and for a very long time. And I actually started taking pilot lessons in junior high. I was in this uh, thing called Civil Air Patrol, which is like this it's kind of like a pre high school during high school, all the way up through college ancillary branch of the air force, where you sort of do air force type stuff and get networked and start flying. Um, and yeah, I think as I got older, right, the risk reward just didn't pan out for me. Um, I'm not big on like in highly disciplined or authoritarian environments where I don't have a say in what to do. So, I think if I wasn't flying like an F-16, <laughs> um, I would have been miserable in the military. So, you know, reality took over and I got a degree in business. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that happens. There we go. That's all just funneling you into capitalism, killing your dreams every step of the way. <laughs> so... I want to I want to talk a little bit about why we're all here as part of the um, the UCAN Foundation. Um, I think everyone probably knows why I'm here, but I'll start if you don't mind, and then pass it off to you guys. I was on Love Is Blind season two. Everybody knows that. Got married, got divorced. Um, you know, struggled with my mental health. Struggled with you know understanding the contract of what I was legally allowed to do, um, legally allowed to say, and. I had then decided I'm going to leave this world. Like I'm going back to my reality because I, I don't have a lot in common with a lot of these people. And, um, you know, I, I didn't have like a lot of, you know, true friendships that came out of it, just a couple. And so I just made that decision. And then it was almost like re-triggering in a sense going through. And actually, so the way Isabel and I met it was actually after the interview I did with you for your psychology today article that was like, I got to get out of this world. I don't care about being famous. I don't care about monetizing my following by selling things I don't believe in. I'm just going to get off of social media for a little bit. I took about, I think seven days off, um, maybe 10 and then just kind of share my journey along the way and go from there. Um, but then as we, Business Insider article came out and I was once again doing these like really long interviews about everything from how I got cast all the way up through where I was in that specific moment. And I thought to myself, I'm like, this was awful. And, you know, when I think about like Danielle and I think about myself and we never should have been in that situation for a plethora of reasons and then to have no support. And I realized like, I've never felt as bad as I felt the last year and, um, someone should do something. And so I know Jeremy had been talking to me about this for a while. Um, and I was just kind of wishy-washy on it. Cause I just didn't want to be a part of it anymore of that world anymore. But, um, you know, I, I believe that when something, when you see something wrong, um, somebody should say something I used to say, well, now I'm the person that says something because otherwise a lot doesn't happen. So that was when I decided, you know what, fuck it. I'm going all in and let's, let's make change because nobody should be in these situations where you don't have food and water. You don't have mental health support. You don't have legal support and you're just exploited for the tunes of a couple bucks an hour to make billions of dollars for these giant production companies and distribution centers. So, um, that's why I joined and I, I'll pass it over to Jeremy, um, before Isabel. 
Yeah, um, good handoff. So I think similar in a sense in the fact that I was also on season two of Love is Blind, um, although many people might not realize that because I had uh, 30 seconds of airtime. Although if you remember me, you don't know that quote. <laughs> um, but you had 15 seconds of fame instead of 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah, that's that's all it took, though. Um, but I think what people don't realize is even though I wasn't featured on the show um, and I only stayed in the pod section, uh, I went through a lot of the same experiences and a lot of the same trauma. And coming out of the show, I was devastated personally. Um, it just the scope and the scale of the manipulation and what that does to your ego and your sense of self and your identity. And I think it's really hard for a lot of people, including myself, right? I went into it understanding there would be some level of manipulation and that it wasn't, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't just the cameras are there and they're just watching us, right? There was going to be something going on, but there's no way to prepare you. Even if someone had talked to me directly and said, this is what's happening, it still wouldn't have fully prepared me to defend against or or to be able to manage the, le the level of sophisticated psychological manipulation that was going on. And it was to the point where within a week, they were having me doing and saying things uh, against my will, essentially. It was like, I remember towards the end, there was this little voice in the back of my head as I was doing or saying things like, like tag, like, no, stop, like, what are you doing? But there was no, I had no ability to actually stop those things, right? It was like I had been hijacked in a sense. And then I got back from that. I took about three days to decompress. And it all kind of came after I caught up in my sleep, um, got enough food, felt rested again. Uh, it all came rushing back. And initially, it was like anger at what they did. Um, rage even right and luckily i had a good psychologist i had been working with before that and continued to work with afterwards and he helped me over the course of several months deal with those emotions and work through it and i think I became, i'm in a healthy place after that right but it didn't change the fact that in my mind what kept recurring and going over and over again was one how can people do this to other people right? <laughs> Especially as more people started coming off of the show and sharing the same experiences, right? This wasn't just a me thing. This was an everybody thing. Um, so one, it was how can people do this to other people and sleep at night? But two, how can what they do be legal? Just in a very literal sense, depriving people of sleep, forcing them to stay in certain locations, not letting them use the bathroom. So it kicked off a crusade for me in the sense of like what Nick said, this is wrong. Somebody has to do something about this. And so I turned that negative emotion of rage and we'll call it even vengeance almost. Right. But I, I, I placated that. And I, I turned that around and turned into something more positive of seeking justice and seeking change. And so that started off with me filing a lawsuit, which is still ongoing. And the lawsuit is around employment law violations, right? Which is one piece of this, but that got it out into the public. And it got into a place where people started to becoming aware this was happening. And then that dovetailed into starting the UCAN Foundation, um, which is where we are today, which doesn't necessarily hit the legal aspects of things from an employment law perspective, but it really focuses in on the exploitation and the human rights violations. Um, and it really is human rights violations, right? It's not just this ambiguous mistreatment. So. It's looking at how can we support people who are going through this now and how can we work to change the industry going forward? So you did it for fame. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think that's a great point. And one thing I want to add to that too is <clears throat> you can't get employment law changes without a lot of work first, right? You have to, you know, everything I always say comes from the ground up, it never comes from the top down. But what we're trying to do with this foundation is help people understand their rights, help them understand that, you know, you, you can't just sign this, this 30 page contract and really know what you're signing up for. When there's things like we can defame you, we can, um, you know, organize dialogue and scenes out of order. So you could, you have no control over it and then tell you, well, you can't go against what we edit and show to the world. So every time you do that, you're going to be fined as well. So there's so many different elements to this that, you know, and everybody goes in with, with the idea, at least that, you know what, like I'm, I'm me and I'm going to just be fine. But when you have the ability to just edit out of order, or as I like to say, it's defamation, um, 
you, you really don't have any control over how you are presented to the world. So I, I just want to, yeah, I just want to reiterate that, like, we're trying to help people know what they're getting into as a starting point for that eventual change that we'll get to. Yeah. And I'll, I'll add a quick point there too, that I think is important context is I have a background in contract management. So my first job was working for a defense contractor, which is maybe ironic given the fighter. I was going to say that actually, <laughs> didn't you work for, um, it was like Lockheed Martin, right? It was for Raytheon. Yeah. Raytheon, Raytheon. Yeah. Um, so I, 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 my first seven years out of undergrad, I negotiated multinational contracts with Greece, with Israel, with Japan, um, as well as the U S government. So, um, and thank you for spreading the empire. <laughs> we'll uh we'll save that to a different discussion um but the, the point is it was basically an honorary contract law degree because i was writing contract language i was interpreting contract language i was using my interpretation to provide recommendations i was closing loopholes i was leaving loopholes open <laughs> um right but all you know that was my job at the time so I was in a position to understand like what was enforceable in this contract and what wasn't. And that's one of the things um, I, I'll try to keep this short, but they didn't give us any time to review it. They gave us a weekend, right? Liter literally, I think like six working hours. Well, I do want to um, say too, that that's different from person to person. So I, I don't, I don't know what yours was. I had time, but I was, okay. well, I, yeah, they I was, didn't, they yeah. didn't give me time, <laughs> which maybe that's, maybe that's by design. I, I'm sure it is, but mm -hmm. I, I had that background to look at the contract and read it and say, okay, this is really onerous. This is a really bad clause, but it's not enforceable, right? And I think that's one message we really want to get out to everybody is just because it's in a contract and just because you sign it does not mean it's legal and does not mean it's enforceable. And what we're going to try to like convey in a number of different ways is a lot of these threatening like, like clauses are just that, they're threats, right? Um, and we want people to feel comfortable understanding that. But I, I, that was just some important context that triggered that Nick's conversation triggered my memory. Yeah. And, and even with the contracts, like you can't contract away a law. Like no. I can't, I can't get someone to sign a contract that says they are now a slave. It, yeah. It's just, you can't do these things. So the, it is like, it is a very, uh, it's a very interesting dynamic from a legal perspective. And, and I, I, think that's so important here. But so, Isabel, how did you get involved in, first of all, the reality TV, I guess, commentary universe, but then also the You Can Foundation? I know I'm kind of out of left field here. I've obviously not been on Love is Blind or on any reality TV show. I'm a psychologist in Massachusetts where we don't have a lot of reality TV in general. So I, I'm kind of I fell into this, um, is how I'll put it. So I write. I'm sure Love is Blind Boston is in the works, if it's not already. You think so? I don't know. I don't know. I we mean, don't see a lot of that. They've gone everywhere else. I think, yeah, I think they're running out of cities because there's like 52 seasons already. Jesus. <laughs> I think well, there's we'll eight. Just anyway, yeah. Yeah. Um, I write for Psychology Today, and I write about on-screen relationships. That's just a way in for people to learn more about relationships and healthy relationships. I'm a couples therapist, first and foremost. So like, I love anything having to do with love and relationships and marriages. So I write about on-screen relationships, and a friend of mine uh, named Lola said, you have to watch Love is Blind and write about this. Everyone loves Love is Blind. It's, there's so much to write about if you watch it. So I randomly watched the third season and wrote about a couple on that season and, and issues I saw between the couple not having to do with production, um, which took off and got a lot of attention. And from there, Jeremy found me and contacted me and talked to me about the UCAN Foundation. Um, and I think I was one of those people who felt like, what are they complaining about? right? Like they got to be on TV. They probably have all these promotions they get paid for. They're probably getting free tickets to everything. I mean, I didn't think that deeply about it, but I think I thought reality TV contestants are all stars and they're all set. You keep talking like that and you will get on the vile file. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to leapfrog my way up. You see? <laughs> She's got her own agenda, actually. That's right. <laughs> I'm dying to get on his show. No, but I think we all have that misperception. And then from talking to Jeremy and talking to you and realizing that like what contestants were doing to each other didn't even begin to compare to how they were being treated by production and the abuses that were happening and um, 
the problems that was causing for people's mental health, but also, and this is obviously my focus, that like couples were suffering and had no chance to survive because of the way the show was operating and treating people. Like that really got to me because I work with couples who have every advantage, every resource, and they still can't make it work. Um, and so we put people in these unfair circumstances and they have no shot, but you're saying that you're giving them a shot. Like I can't handle that. So I agreed to to join and to try to help fix this problem as best I could. Well, I'm happy to to have you. And I will say too, like talking to you initially back in December, that was when I was really like, you know what? It it wasn't so I mean, it is bad, but like they say they provide you couples counseling. They say there's a mental health professional on set. Um, and you know, when I started going back and thinking, I'm like, man, like we didn't stand a chance. We were building toxic habits that were being instituted and influenced by producers. Uh, we didn't have anyone to come in and help us navigate these conflicts. Um, where in real life, you don't always, but you know, you, you might have someone. And then even at the time that the show came out, like, and still to this day, we we're in COVID and like so many more people thankfully have, have suck out therapy, but, um, yeah, it, it's just like, that was really sticking with me after our talk that it just felt like, oh my God, these couples don't even have a chance. No, they really don't have a chance and they could. And this is the part that gets me upset is like Netflix obviously has billions of dollars. They could pay for a couple's therapist to be on set and to intervene at every possible moment and help people fix the problem and communicate and develop a healthy attachment. And they could produce super happy couples from it. And they choose not to do that because they want to instead manipulate people and make drama. And they've got their own reasons for that. But I think an important point around that is I always like to separate out people from systems. Um, I think most people are generally sympathetic, empathetic, compassionate people. Um, they potentially get caught up in systems that forces cognitive dissonance where they have, you know, they keep working under, you know, tricking themselves to thinking their job is they're doing the right thing. Right. But that's a different subject, but I want to focus on the systems and not the people. And Isabel, to your point there, they have, they have a choice, right? Netflix as a corporation, as a system, they have a choice to do these things, right? Kinetic is the production company has a choice to do this more ethically, but it's less profitable. Right. But is it, no, is it maybe. less profitable? Well, I would make the case that it is, right? Because if you distill it down to its most basic level, um, it's a for-profit company. And not only that, it's a publicly traded company. And it's act this, a lot of people don't know this. It's actually a law that you have to, every action has to maximize shareholder value, right? That's a law. Well, yeah, that's capitalism. Yeah. But it's a law. Like it's it's actually you could get you could go to jail if you're found grossly in violation of that. So mm -hmm. but the point I'm making is the the baseline incentive when you distill out everything else is profitability, right? So what does a very well run, well funded, um, profitable company do? They take the path that maximizes profitability, right? They may not be perfect at it, but it's not about like I don't think anybody is saying, oh, I I love manipulating people. I mean, I, I guess I could make the case that there's one or there's one or two individuals uh, that I was in contact with that I think do well, leave it at that. Like maybe they do have a personal vested interest in that. But in a general sense, um, net, like these companies aren't saying we're out here to manipulate and hurt people, right? Mm -hmm. These companies are out here to make profit, and because there are zero regulations around this stuff they're go like they're just going to do everything they can to maximize that profit and so they're going to cut out the things that they can cut out which includes mental health support which includes any sort of um like taking care of the cast health or any sort of ethical considerations there most other industries have laws because they know if they don't have these laws these companies which are sociopathic by their nature they're for profit they're going to abuse and exploit and that's why you have labor laws for some reason this industry has gotten away without labor laws. There are none, right? They use loopholes to get to get outside of everything. And so what has resulted in is gross human rights violations that even the, Gene the Geneva Convention, which dictates how you can handle prisoners of war, um, has more stringent requirements than how cast members are treated. 
See, I don't know. Nick, I see it more maliciously, I think, than you do. From the stories you've told me about the specific tactics they used and how they manipulated people and the way they controlled basic needs, it feels more like there was more intent behind it than just, <clears throat> I don't know, but I wasn't there. So, Well, when I think about like the amount of times I had to ask for water only to not get it or get like one bottle when I could like chug that in a second at any given point in the day in normal life. And, you know, I think about like in a best case scenario, maybe a, a producer or a runner or an associate producer, they have a hundred things on their mind. Maybe it just didn't stay top of mind. Best case scenario. But then my question to that is, well, why is there just not someone then that's in charge of the water, right? Why isn't there someone that just makes sure there's water and food on set at all times. Well, out of all the project management going on to produce something that massive, getting people water is the least difficult logistical challenge. Yeah. Well, the person who got the alcohol could surely be in charge of the water. <laughs> well. Yeah, we had plenty of we had there was never a lack of alcohol, right? They could have used that same system. And when there when there was that lasted about 15 seconds. Yeah. Yeah, the the second we said, "Hey, we're out of we're out of like whiskey, this shitty whiskey to do shots," <laughs> um, within we're ten seconds, we had, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, within within ten seconds, there was a new bottle. Isabel, what are some of the like specific things that you saw when you were watching? And it could be any of the seasons. I know you've shared that in your writing before, but what are some of the specific scenes or experiences you saw people go through that really really wanted you to made you want to step in? Yeah, you know, and I honestly hesitate a little bit to talk about it. So I'll leave specific people out of it because, and I think I'll never write about couples on reality TV again, to be honest, after knowing what happens behind the scenes and the way people are impacted by being on the shows and then by public opinion and backlash afterwards, I feel like I can't be any part of it, even from like a clinical distance professional perspective. Um, but I will say, I just saw a lot of bad behavior. I mean, to the extent of emotional abuse between contestants and bad communication patterns and people obviously being pumped with alcohol and then having fights all over with family, with friends, with each other, and all these opportunities for someone to step in and deescalate them and teach them how to manage the conflict um, and to reduce the pressure of the situation and how there was just no help for them and people getting put into this scenario where they have to make a life-changing decision or give up the person that they love. And it just felt so abusive. It felt so wrong. It felt like they were being exploited and they were exploiting each other. And some people aren't even in it for real. And it just felt um, like this just can't be good for people. And it can't be good for viewers either. Like no one's taking the right messages from watching this. And we should all be aware of that fact. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I also, to tie it back to what um, I was, the case I was making against you, Jeremy, it's not that it's not these production companies maximizing their profits. Like that's the world we live in. You have to maximize profits. My my thought was, and you've said this before, people are dramatic as they as it is. I mean, we go through our everyday life and have these dramatic interactions with people. Um, so I I think the show could be just as successful and profitable if you had some of the stuff Isabel was saying, like learning how to navigate the conflict and learning how to communicate better. And actually that would normalize, first of all, challenges that people face in their relationships. Second of all, how you can work towards them or at least come to a conclusion together in a healthy setting that this isn't going to work as opposed to, you know, being contractually obligated to be in certain places and scenarios and situations that you wouldn't really be in in real life. Yeah. And I, I don't disagree. I actually don't disagree with you on that, but there's, it's, it's inertia, right? This is how it's always been done. And so to change that, even, even if someone at the top made a, made a business case that we can be just as profitable doing this ethically, there's still an actuarial risk assessment around that. And that risk factor is going to downgrade the profitability. Like any, any time you make a switch. So if they're, if they're doing an analysis on this, even if, they're making the case that at the end, it's just as profitable. There's mm -hmm. still a risk factor there, which prevents any change. Well, and I, you know, really quickly, I want to touch on this too. So 
reality TV has a, cause you know, we have the writer strike, right? The WGA strike reality TV has a history of really growing during writer strikes. So in the late eighties, it was shows like cops and talk shows and the, um, you know, rescue nine one one and unsolved mysteries and all of these shows that were kind of like the OG reality TV shows. And then again, in 2008, when the writers next writer strike happened, that was when it kind of exploded into what we see now with like the bachelor nation. And I think the bachelor just announced a whole nother show to, to go in there. And so all of this stuff happening with the writers guild of America right now, striking is only going to increase reality TV production and therefore increase exploitation and, um, you know, the, the, the devastation that it can do to someone and their mental health. So it's just a, it's just a, it's a moment right now. We're in, we're in the middle of a moment where more eyes are going to be on this than ever before. And I feel like as a society that's entertained by this stuff, we have an obligation to make sure that people aren't, um, li their lives aren't destroyed. Yeah. And can we emphasize that people's lives really do get destroyed by this? Like, it's not people you're imagining people that I probably imagined at first, but like somebody in Texas gets to go on a show and they fly out to California and then they fly them back to Texas and drop them back in their town with no support, no help. They've made no money off of it. They don't get any deals. If they weren't a star, they get no further exposure. And like, that's it. Lives really do get destroyed by it. It's incredibly upsetting. It is. And people, you know, when you say lives destroyed, there's people who have been misedited to have said something that they didn't actually say, or that's completely out of context, or that was actually a response to something else that was said earlier. And when you're taking these tactics and you're, you're projecting someone out to the world inaccurately, that's devastating for it. First, it, even if it isn't that bad of, of a, like, it doesn't make you look that bad, you get gaslit by watching this. And I, I just literally, there's scenes that I would watch. I'd be like, that didn't happen that way. I know it did. And then I'm like, did it? No, it didn't happen that way. So it's so damaging just emotionally, but it's also damaging when you just throw people out there and, and have them say and do things that they didn't actually say and do, or at least lack the context. I specifically think of, um, I don't, I can't watch the show, um, anymore. Not, I mean, I watched season one and two, obviously, but I, I heard that there was someone in season four, I think I saw it on TikTok and I don't remember who it was, but he got labeled a plagiarist and they actually gave him because he's an attorney. They actually gave him the footage that they cut where he is actually proving that he is not plagiarizing that song that he's saying. And I think about like, if you like plagiarism, you're going to make someone a plagiarist it's just reckless. It's just completely reckless. You ruin, you ruin an attorney's career by doing that. Again, I always try to put myself in the position of viewers because, you know, three or four years ago, um, I would think the same thing, right? I'm very sympathetic to that position because I would probably, I never really watched reality TV, but looking from the outside on, in on this, I can understand why people would assume that there's no harm done. These people are fine. They're making a lot of money. Right. But I think, to anyone listening to this, the, the concept of your identity being ruined is a really difficult thing to like swallow ambiguously. So to make it really concrete, just imagine that if all over social media, all over the news, all over press, um, on Reddit, every, every single social media or news form you can think of, um, someone was spreading the word that you're a Nazi, right? And by the way, if you try to defend yourself and say you're not a Nazi, um, you're liable to pay a million dollars each time you try to do that. And so the only choice you have is to roll with that narrative that you're a Nazi. And apologize. Like a public apology. And, and, and apologize. Yeah. And, and, try, and, and try to create your life around this new persona of you being a Nazi. And I, I want to like really hammer home the point that that is not exaggeration. It's a literal language in the in the contract. It's 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 reality. Um, that's actually how it works. And I'm not using Nazi to like exaggerate the position or as a hyperbole. Um, that sort you know, if someone's cast as a villain, they can be edited as something that is totally 
that doesn't reflect any part of their personality in real life, right? A total Frankenstein monster that does not exist, does not actually exist, right? But these production companies can put it out there as a real person, say, this is you. And if you try to defend yourself, we're going to sue you for a million dollars each time you try to defend yourself. So I think if people watching this are having trouble wrapping their head around this, do a thought experiment, like run through this exercise. What if my entire social media, my Facebook, my Instagram, everything, right? And, and media outlets I didn't even know all of a sudden were saying I was a Nazi and I couldn't do anything to defend myself, where my only choice was to ex like admit that I am and start apologizing. How, how would you handle that? I would break it down even further and just, and everyone can relate to this feeling of imagine when somebody incredibly close to you sees you in a way that you don't see yourself, right? When you're being accused of saying something or doing something in your relationship, and all you want to do is defend yourself and explain why you didn't mean it or you didn't try to do harm, right? Like when you feel disconnected from people that are incredibly important to you, we all have the need to defend and explain and reconnect right? Even on a one-on-one -on -one relationship, let alone when the whole world sees you in a way and you can't, there's no possibility of repair and reconnecting. I mean, that is one of the Yeah. And you have, you, you have hundreds of strangers uh, like giving you death threats for that. I just had Dr. Kirk Honda on my uh, show from C Psychology in Seattle. It's like a tongue twister. And I had him on to talk about what he experienced with online bullying and um, he he actually was telling, and, and he's like he's a, he's a content creator and a psychologist and a professor. He's normal guy, and he did some commentary on Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. And I guess there were both sides. And by the way, his con he's like the gentlest person in the world with his content. He gives everyone the benefit of the doubt. He gives every, you know, he's similar to what you said is about like, he, there's times he just wants to like hop in there and mediate. And, um, he was getting, he found, he was getting death threats. Um, he went on Reddit and was on some, some, some sort of hit list. He also had an entire, um, subreddit that was organizing to get, take away his license to practice get him fired from his school and basically ruin his life. And they were organizing and talking about ways that they were going to silence his supporters and opposing viewpoints so that they could just control this narrative that he was a monster from commentating his professional opinion on that trial. And when you think about, and then he sat there and said, well, I didn't have it as bad as you did. I'm like, I don't think anyone was trying to kill me. Like, <laughs> You know, it's like, or ruin my life. But, um, you know, those are the things that are happening to people who go on these shows. And they can edit. And I've had plenty of people that I've been talking to the last few weeks who whose lives were ruined. Um, there was another person and her, she lost her entire business because they just flooded it with bad reviews, all because of an edit. All because of an edit. To hammer home that point, right? It's there's kind of, it's, it's everybody that leaves these shows. Like even someone like myself who didn't have a lot of publicity and didn't get a lot of that social media angst or um, aspersions cast at me, uh, I still got some of it. And I'll say like, even at 1% of the level that Nick got, it was still very anxiety inducing and a very difficult thing to handle, even at a small volume. And so it doesn't matter whether you have a large following or not. It's, it creates a massive mental stress and it could disrupt your entire life. But mm -hmm. e so for the, for every one person you see who has a massive following, who you're aware of, right? Cause when, you, as viewers, when viewers think of reality TV cast members, they, they obviously only think about the people who are well-known, right? The people with massive followings, but for every person that viewers know of, there are probably a hundred cast members they don't know of who who are worse off financially, worse off mentally, and worse off emotionally than before they were on the show. And again, not exaggeration there. But even the people who are doing really well or seem to be doing really well, it's important to note that it's they seem to be doing really well. And a lot of them are just hostages to their situation because they can't change their narrative. And maybe they are making some money out of it, but their life is never going to be the same. They can never get their real identity back. And the only way that they can make sense of this financially is to keep spinning in this drama at the behest of the producers and distribution companies that are essentially 
paying them to promote this platform of a false identity. And it's, I mean, that's an incredibly traumatic thing as well. So when you see these seemingly successful reality TV cast members on social media, take a step back and ask the question, am I just seeing a, a illusion or are they actually healthy? Are they actually happy? Are they actually successful? And Nick can back this up, but I can tell you from personal experience, knowing some of these people, um, a lot of them are extre in extremely bad shape. When you put you put yourself out there in a way that is also inauthentic by nature. So what I mean by that is, and someone asked me this on my podcast and they ask me anything at the end, what was it like to be famous for your relationship, not for you? And I think to myself about that all the time because I had an entire public commenting on my relationship and they didn't know either of us individually. They didn't know where we came from. They didn't know what was going on day to day in our actual lives. And they all had opinions and commentary on it. And even, you know, when, with Nick Vile and his comments about us and the, the foundation, it would have taken him 30 seconds to look at my profile and see that I active in my community. I just organized with a working families party to get our mayor elected. I have a podcast that doesn't make any money. We are really like in this situation with this where you get known for one element. If it's your relationship or if it's, you know, on Survivor, you're the person that ate something crazy or did something crazy. But that it's not a full picture of who these people are. And there's new people are nuanced. Nobody is 100% one thing or another. Everybody, it all fluctuates. And I think that is also very important to keep in mind. Um, you know, and it, my favorite one is when I, I, I'm politically active and people are like, stay in your lane, reality star. What? <laughs> oh, I get that all the time. Stay in your lane. Stay in my lane. What's my lane? Taking s photos and posting them on social media. Like, and every time I do that, I get a million dollars dropped off at my house or Venmo to me from Netflix. Like it, it's such a misconception across the board and it's so damaging because you, you also feel like you can't even be yourself. And one more story and then I'll shut up. I'll remember like the first time I talked to our publicist after the show and they were like, okay, who are you? What do you want to talk about? Like my onboarding. And I was like, okay, well. I make a lot of my own stuff because I don't really trust, um, you know, all of the things happening with our food and our, our manufacturing industry and all the, the chemicals and all that. So I make a lot of my own products. Um, I'm very into self-care and, you know, therapy has helped me a lot. And it's not always the easiest thing for me to talk about, but I want to get better at it. And then I want to talk about news and politics. And they're like, okay, pump the brakes. You can't really do any of those. So if you want to talk about mental health, you got to keep it high level and positive. I wouldn't talk about um, your DIY stuff too much because you're going to alienate brands and brand deals. And I'd stay away from news and politics is too dividing. And I was sitting there and I'm like, this is me. This is me. This is, these are the nuances of me. And I can't be any of them. You know, and so the first thing I did was I went on a news and politics show, and that was my response to that. Um, you know, I posted some DIY videos of how I make my own soap, and you know, I talk about whatever I feel like talking about with with mental health and whatever's important to me in that moment. So, my point of that is is I'm not saying I'm better than anyone. I'm more stubborn than a lot of people, and the things that are important to me are important to me. Period. But that's an ex excessive amount of pressure when you're newly to the public eye to be told you can't be yourself, we need you to be something else. And that, that pressure of that, the psychological pressure of that, and then having a public of hundreds of thousands. And honestly, when you're on these shows, like your, your reach is beyond your following people recognize you that don't follow you on social media. And so when you have a global show like Netflix, the whole world's commenting on you and your relationship, whether it worked out or whether it didn't, and you're expected to act a certain way and not be yourself in a lot of instances. It's just a, a very weird dynamic to navigate. Yeah. You're not very obedient. You're not a good follower. Neither of you. I've learned that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm too stubborn. Yeah. Well, people who have found out that I'm involved right with you, Ken, and working with the two of you, I can't tell you how many people have asked. Like, so 
you know, is Jeremy just doing this because yada, yada, yada? Like, is he just angry he didn't get more airtime, right? Is Nick really like this? And da, 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 like the images that people have of you from the show, right? And whatever statements have been made about you by the show, by other people really sink in. And my answers are always, uh, I mean, like, no, they're just like pretty normal, regular people who are complicated and have many interests and aren't exactly what you imagine they are. And they're also just not like, I think they expect a lot more tea for me, but like, there's a lot going on in your love lives that we're talking about all the time. Like, it's not, <laughs> not actually what their lives are like. I don't know what to tell you. It's such a misconception. It's such a misconception. And, and I think it's, it's important to dispel this notion that we're doing this for fame or money. Right. And this is, um, this is really, really hard work. Um, starting a nonprofit is a business, right? You, you have to do all the business things around a business, right? And but a you little can't, more sometimes because you have different and, regulations. And even more because there's regulations around it, right? So it's actually harder to start a nonprofit than start a business. Um, you, you, there's nothing to sell right? You don't have a product really. There's, you know, there's the education around it, right? But this is really, really difficult stuff. And I personally, for the past month have been spending a month, more than a month now, um, 40 to 50 hours a week um, with no pay, just whenever I get a chance um, working on this, because that's what it takes, right? There's, it's every single hat. It's the accountant. It's the, it's the CFO. It is the business development. It is the fundraiser. It's like, it's the website designer. It's the developer. It's human resources. Um, we have to do all of this stuff. And not to mention onboard 200 plus therapists and 30 plus or however many lawyers and attorneys we're at. And then by the way, all the people that are like, oh, I want to help. I don't exactly know how or, or what, but I want to help. And so all of that, it, it's a lot. So when, when people, when you think about like, on, like entrepreneurship and it being a very difficult journey and a very difficult thing to do and, and a, a long uphill battle, right? The reason why people decide to engage in that is because they believe they can become financially wealthy afterwards, right? They believe in the long term they can make a lot of money out of this. Is that not guess, why we're doing this? Well, guess, guess what? You cannot... You cannot do that in a nonprofit. That's the whole point of a nonprofit. There is no owner's equity. There is no profit, nonprofit. So we're going through, we're jumping through all the hoops and all the scary, difficult things of an entrepreneur, right? We're not making any money off of this. We're not even being paid right now. Um, but there is no carrot at the end to make money. Like there is no carrot to make a lot of wealth out of all of this. It's never going to happen. Just yeah, we're just trying to like, I know for me, I'm just trying to help people. And sometimes I do feel being fully transparent. I feel like they, a lot of people don't want this help, but I just think that they've been so beaten down mentally to and accepting this as okay, that, um, you know, that you signed up for it. And I'd love to hear both of your thoughts on that. Cause I know I get it all the time. Um, <clears throat> you know, that you signed up for it. You don't know what you're signing up for you. You can read a contract. You can even talk to someone. You don't know what you're signing up for. So I know for me, it's like I did not sign up. I signed up for a psychological love experiment. I did not sign up to work 18 to 20 hours a day. I did not sign up to make, you know, equivalent to $7.14 an hour. I did not sign up to be, you know, mentally abused and get all of this trauma coming out of this experience because I couldn't get the support that, you know, me and my relationship needed. Like I didn't sign up for any of that. I signed up for a psychologically based love experiment that goes through rigorous, and I'm using air quotes, protocols to ensure people's safety the entire time that is just outright not true. So it, I don't know, it, either of you want to add a comment on that? I'm curious because the you signed up for it is, is everywhere. A lot, all of the detractors say that. There's there's a certain segment that I don't think we're ever going to reach with that just because it's so easy to say. Um, of and course, there, you don't you don't have to have any rationale or evidence to support it, right? But well, there's a projection going on there too, the, for for sure. And and there's certain people that we're never going to convince, and that's fine. Um, but it's this notion of you signed up for it is, um, you know, Nick gave just some very generalized examples here, but I think it's important to note that during the entire casting process, which for me was over a year, they first reached out to me before COVID. Um, the entire casting process, they they set a certain expectation very deliberately about what it is, why they're selecting you, and what it's for, right? So they they spend a very long time instilling this sense of what you're signing up for. Hey, here's what you're signing up for, 
right? And then when you get there, you realize it's not that at all. They're not, like, it's not about you connecting. It's not about you finding love. It's about them forcing you into a mold. And if you don't fit into that mold, they cast you aside, right? And you don't have a lot of free will or a lot of say, but specific examples to make it more tangible. So I signed up to have my cell phone taken away during the pods. I actually really, I actually really enjoyed that personally. I was looking forward to that. It was great. It was great. Um, I did. I did not sign up for and was never told that when they took our cell phones, they would also take our wallets, our IDs, our credit cards, our passports, everything that's personally identifiable. They just take it and it's gone. And before you have time to react, you no longer have any currency or any form of ID. And from that moment, you are now at their beck and call. You can't even leave your room without their permission. You're a prisoner, right? So again, I signed up to have my phone taken away, 100%. I did not sign up to have my identity stripped from me to make me a, to make me a literal prisoner, right? Um, I, I signed up to have cameras watch me connect with people. I did not sign up to be socially isolated in my hotel room for 24 hours straight without my hotel key. I did not sign up to not being able to use the bathroom for hours on end because to go to the bathroom, we had to have an escort. I did not sign up to be starved, to lose eight pounds in one week. I did not sign up to constantly ask for water and always be dehydrated and never get it. I did not sign up to have my most intimate mo moments and um, emotions about past relationships used as a weapon against me to force me to cry on camera and or, or they wouldn't let me go until I did, right? I Nobody signs up for these things. Nobody is told this is what's gonna happen. Nobody can even, even if you're a big follower of reality TV, and if you listen to podcasts like Game of like Game of Roses, which is great, um, you can still never anticipate what this is going to feel like and what's actually going to happen to you. So that notion of you know what you signed up for is so patently false on every single aspect, right? The people that say that and who believe that and who refuse to change their mind, they are on the same level as flat earthers because there is all of the evidence is against it. And again, I'm not exaggerating. There is, there is all, all of the evidence from the people who have been through it say that that's not true. But you know what else it is? And this, even my husband said, when I first began talking about what was actually happening behind the scenes and his response, and he is like a very stubborn person who might've done this was like, well, they could have just left. No one can hold you against your will. They could have demanded, right? Like they, they could have, they could have, they could have. And I had to have a real, a real hard talk about sure like we have human have free will yada yada but like you don't understand in that kind of situation when there's an authority figure who has power who has your cell phone who has limited your access to everything in the world like you're not really in a position to negotiate or to push back if you're worried you're going to get fined 50 grand and you can't afford it then you really are like an endangered servitude situation it's just not as simple as well, you knew, and even if you didn't know, you could have done something about it. Like, it's a lovely idea. It's not how it I would love to hear your thoughts on the Stanford Prison Experiment um, analogy to this, because that what you just said is proven in psychology. So I, mean, what are, I think the reason I reached out to you was because in your article, you mentioned that, and that struck a chord with me. Well, and I, I want to just add really quick, and then I want to get to that. So when Danielle and I were in Mexico after she had her panic attack, we were going to leave. And we had this moment where we were, everyone, it was all hands on deck. The executive producer came, all the producers were there and they were all trying to talk us out of leaving. And there's always that looming threat that you're gonna have to pay 50K in damages. So that's in the contract, that's there. But we realized like, don't have a wallet. We're in Mexico, we're in a resort. Don't have a wallet, don't have a room key. Could climb out through the pool if we really wanted to. But then what? You didn't have IDs either. Like, how do you get out of the country? <laughs> yeah. What are you going to, you're going to, yeah, you're going to leave the resort. Yeah. You're going to leave the resort. I mean, it just, it's crazy. And even when you're traveling, like you get your passport right at the gate and then you give it or your ID or whatever you need right at the gate. And then you give it back the moment you're through the gate because otherwise you're not going to be able to get on. So it's, it's incredibly difficult in the most dire circumstances to actually leave 
Now, could we have demanded our IDs and everything back? We would have had to <laughs> to do anything, but you, you're not you're not just getting your life filmed and you can be like, I'm done today. Like you are you are stuck, especially in those first three weeks of Love Is Blind. Yeah, I mean, I'll touch on that one, but I think the one that's even more relevant is probably the Milgram experiment. But the Stanford Prison experiment is um, Zimbardo, a guy in Stanford, wants to do research on following authority, and he takes students and splits them into two groups: some who are going to be the guards of this fake jail, and some who are going to be the prisoners. And I forget how long he had it slated for—a week or two weeks or something—where he would just put them in this environment and let them be a little prison system. And it got out of control so fast that they had to stop the experiment after a few days because the guards were abusing the other students who were the prisoners and the prisoners were revolting and the abuse was so significant that they couldn't continue the experiment, which speaks a lot to how power can go to people's heads and how abuse can happen so quickly and easily. And, and um, none, of, none of these prisoners, they, they all could have left, presumably, right? Again, there's you could make that same argument like, oh, well, if they were being abused, they could have just left, right? No one was right. forcing them to stay. And they probably also like could have had easier access to their IDs or wallets, yeah. right? Yeah. Right. But so why, why didn't they? Uh, they they tried to, but the guards became incredibly abusive and controlling. They limited their access to things like food and water in the bathroom. Like they really became intensely authoritarian and abusive. And and there, it was a prison setup. Like there were prison cells they couldn't get out of. And so yeah, the experimenters had to step in and stop it because it got like so out of hand. That's in, yeah. That's just so insane when you think about it. I I. Th- Let's hear the other one. What was the yeah, the, the, bu- other the buzzy experiment? one? Let's hear the buzzy one. So Milgram is the most popular one. Um, it was Milgram wanted to study obedience to authority figures, and so he would have um, people come in, and and they were supposed to be teaching somebody behind a wall to get the correct. They were supposed to be learning things. And whenever the person, the learner got it wrong, the person who was on the other side was supposed to electrocute them, give them like a little shock. And it, the shocking went up to, I forget what volts, but like a lethal level of volts of killing somebody. And it was like, well, it was it was on the the display for the participant to say like, because it had, it had a scale, right? And at the very top of the scale, it said like lethal, lethal yeah. dose. Like it was like very, it was very explicit. That, yeah. Yeah. So like you would know they would, I haven't heard of this before. They would know that this dose would kill someone and they would still do it. Mm -hmm. So they're in a room trying to teach this person word pairs. They don't know that the person, the learner is actually a part of the experiment and not actually being shocked every time. They think the person's really being shocked. So every time they get it wrong, they have to give a shock and they have to increase in the voltage every time they get it wrong. They've got an experimenter standing there next to them who is telling them to keep doing it. So as they're going up the scale, shocking someone and some of the conditions, they have the learner start to cry out and say, stop it, get me out of here, this hurts. Or at one point when one of the people says, like, I have a heart condition, like, get me out of here. I don't wanna do this anymore. And a shocking number, like the vast majority of people continue shocking the other person up to the lethal level. Even when the person is no longer responding to the prompts and possibly presumably dead, they continue shocking because the experimenter stands there. And if they ever say, like, I don't know about this, I don't feel good about this, the experimenter says, you, you must continue with the experiment. And people listen. That's all so, it takes. And, and, do, you, and do, you, do you think that all of those people that listened are bad people? No. I mean, I think we're just people. Humans are, like, we're social animals. We listen to authority. We have hierarchies. Like, it's a very normal, okay part of being a human, but... We have to be aware of it because we could do real damage to people if we yeah. don't take accountability for it. So how, how does that how does that translate to this notion of they could have just left whenever they wanted to? There's somebody who's an authority figure who has power over you, who has your ID, who, who has you know, a fine you have to pay. You're going to listen to them. If they reassure you, if they say, no, you have to keep doing this, people are going to keep doing this. And this was, you know, people aren't even hurting themselves as much right like Mm -hmm. this is you just hurting yourself being a part of this show and somebody's saying you've got to keep doing it so you do it you're not even hurting killing somebody else it's very easy to control and manipulate people we hate Mm -hmm. to know that because we all think that we're strong and we have free will we're very easy to control well i specifically remember telling producers over and over i'm like hey i'm pretty like convicted in my 
thoughts and how I feel about things and I'm not going to be able to be manipulated. You won't get me to say something that I wouldn't say in real life. And I'm going to be behave in a way that I wouldn't behave in real life. And I would say like from that level, they weren't, but that's not the case for everyone, but they weren't for me, but it's that whole system of, I wasn't sleeping. I wasn't on my normal sleep schedule. I wasn't on my normal structure of working working out. I was not able to eat and consume beverages the way that I would normal life. You're just constantly put in this, um, this situation that's so outside of reality and what it would be like that you really don't even, you, the level it's happening, you don't even really realize until you look back on it, at least in the case of love is blind. And, and, and I want to like draw that out a little bit and, and slightly pivot, but, you know, we've been talking a lot about the mental health ramifications afterwards and some of the manipulation and exploitative techniques and tactics that happen during the show. But I think there is also just like very explicit abuse and human rights violations during the show as well. And we're talking, you know, I've had conversations with people who will, of course, remain anonymous, but sexual assault, physical battery. Um, we're talking like the worst kinds of physical and mental harm being inflicted, sometimes deliberately, right? Or be putting people in deliberate situations when you're forcing two people to sleep in the same bed together, forcing two people to sleep in the same bed together, and then forcing alcohol down your down their throats. Um, they're being deliberately put in these situations where they are going to get like raped or sexual or like physically abused battery. Um, there, there is a lot of really awful, awful things going on. And I, and the reason why you don't hear about it is because if there's enough evidence for these, for these things that are happening, it gets caught up in the arbitration clause in the contract, which is sealed from the public record. And if there's enough evidence, these companies will just pay out a settlement, um, and make this person sign an NDA. So every, every so often we hear drips of some sort of massive abuse that happened, but we never get the details about it. Because again, it happens all the time, but it's if, if someone speaks out, it's caught up in the arbitration and it's sealed from the public record. But more frequently, people don't speak out because they're scared. And I, I think it's important to realize that this, this kind of abuse, right, up to including sexual assault and physical battery is not unusual. It happens, it's been happening for decades. Mm -hmm. Right. We've talked to people. We've talked to people from shows from 15 years ago who have said the same yeah. things. And it happens across the industry. It doesn't matter what type of show you're on. It happens. And I think like that's that's what we need people to realize is like, look, there is it's not it's not just this sometimes hard to understand mental manipulation harm, which is extremely harmful. Right. It runs the gamut of everything. And. It is, it is this really just incredible situation where it's been going on for the better part of two decades and it's still going on and it's getting worse because the perpetrators are emboldened because nothing stopped them, right? Um, and I think it's important for people to realize that because we're not just fighting for mental health, although that's a very important thing. We're, we're fighting to protect people from a, in a very literal sense, human beings. And there's something about watching someone on TV that dehumanizes them. And I feel like that is such a dangerous approach that's going to cause that causes people to, to dehumanize in their mind, which is what causes them to say, well, you signed up for it or what causes them to say, um, you know, well, you shouldn't have gone on the show, like all of that stuff. And, it takes away the fact that these are human beings and they are psychologically manipulated. They are physically manipulated and people lose track of that somehow just because they see you on TV. Um, on that note, we got to wrap this up in five minutes or so. Um, is there anything else we want to cover? We covered a lot. <clears throat> That's the main stuff. Yeah. Cool. I, I think, um, just reiterate like where your donations so, like people who donate like where does it go um because we do rely on donations um and we are we are um tax exempt we were incorporated under irs 501c3 
Um, so we are we are a charity from that perspective. Your your donations will be tax exempt at the end of the year. But w where does it go? And a, a really good example is um, something that we're working with a partner law firm right now, and they're helping us develop a standard response that will help um, individuals. One, we can just give them this document that will help individuals understand their contract before they sign it without having to go to a lawyer. Right. So we're enabling people with this standard response to understand their contract ahead of time. And we're, this, you know, we're developing a similar document, which helps people address the threats they get on the back end for speaking up. Right. Because a lot of these are threats and you can't silence somebody for um, whistleblowing about abuse or exploitation. But it's effective because these threats are so very powerful and they come. It's explicit phone calls even saying, like, don't talk or we'll sue you. Right. So. Um, we're working with a law firm to develop a legal response to these to provide to exploited cast members. And um, this is a great example because while this law firm is providing us a very discounted rate, um, it's it's not free, right? They're spending about 15 to 20 hours of research to build this up and create it and provide it to us. Um, and so donations go towards things like this, right? Helping to create material and resources that cast members can use. Um, or another one is we're building a network that brings together cast members. It brings together partners um, like our legal partners, our mental health partners to provide that direct support. And that that sort of um, that network requires infrastructure, right? It requires a private chat server that, that's moderated by real people that has that has to ensure anonymity and privacy, right? Um, so the, the money that's donated to us goes directly to supporting these cast members in one way or another. Um, in sometimes very tangible ways. And obviously there are, you know, running the business aspects of it, but right now there's no labor costs at all. Every, all of that is pro bono at the moment. Yes, it is. Sure is, it sure is. Um, <clears throat> again, I appreciate what you guys are doing or what we're doing together. Um, we're going to try and help some people and that's the, the point. Um, so. For anyone who says you signed up for it, um, you know, I hope you can have a little bit of grace and, and hopefully be open to a little bit of a, a different take on things. But before we go, I always like to give everyone a chance to ask me anything, even though you guys know me a little better than a lot of my other guests. But um, if there's anything you want to ask, now's the time. Yeah, I have one. No. Uh, does Grayson want a sibling? Do you think he'll ever get another dog? I mean... I'm looking at him now. He's passed out over here. I think about it, but he gets so, he's so needy that the moment there's, a, Jeremy's <laughs> experienced this because he's brought his yeah. dogs over. <laughs> the moment there's another dog around, he needs the attention. The moment you pet another dog, he's in between you and that dog. It doesn't matter if it's me. It doesn't matter if it's one of you. He is just too, he's too much. He needs all the attention and he never thinks he's getting enough or what he deserves. So maybe someday, but I don't know. I, I think he's too needy. <laughs> the anxious attachment. Exactly. Mm -hmm. He's so cute sitting over here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've, I've got mine also in a little bed down there. Um, <laughs> should bring the dogs in the podcast. Um, so Nick, I've I've got you uh, I've got you locked in in a corner here. Uh, when are you going to come by for your next training session? <laughs> I've been <laughs> I've been I've been very so. Jeremy has been personal training me for what is it five or six weeks now? It's been a while, yeah. So um, I have been sticking to everything you've said, and I have noticed a difference. But probably need to do that sooner than later. Once things, maybe next week or something, when things settle down. Yeah, hopefully. We'll figure, I keep saying that. Some... Every, <laughs> I'm like, every week things are going to settle down and then the week comes and they don't. They don't settle they, down. They never do. We just, we just got to carve it out, man. I've got some really great um, next steps and progressions for you to really like awesome. hone in on some of that stuff. I'm not awesome. getting any free training here, free personal training. Do you want some? I don't know, maybe. Okay, well, let's talk. <laughs> well, it starts... <laughs> Better order a 35 pound kettlebell because that's where it all began for I'm, me. I'm all about the bells, <laughs> the metal purse. <laughs> well, thank you guys for coming on and, and chatting with all of us here. Um, Isabel, you can go first. Where can people find you on your social media, your website, any of that? 
Oh, me? Uh, people can find me yeah. at my Instagram, Dr. Isabel Morley, or Drizabel Morley, as it's more commonly known, um, or my website if they want to go to my website, read my blog, drisabelmorley.com. Awesome. And Jeremy, what about you? Yeah. Um, so it's easiest to find me on LinkedIn. You can just type in my name, Jeremy Hartwell, and I'll come right up. Um, or you can go to my performance coaching website, uh, paratusperformancecoaching.com. Um, actually, is that it? I don't think that's it. I think it's paratusperformancecoaching.net. There we go. Um, it's been a while. <laughs> the link will I'm, be in I'm the so, bio. <laughs> I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm, I'm so ingrained in the nonprofit, I've forgotten my own website name. Oh, and not, and not link in the bio. The link will be in the description. Yeah. <laughs> cool. um, so that's the easiest way to seek me out, but LinkedIn or my company website. Cool. Well, thank you guys so much. And we will uh, be talking soon. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode of Eyes Wide Open. If you enjoy the show, the best way to support us is by sharing or dropping a review. For more information and content, check out engagewithnick.com or find me on Instagram at nthompson513. Don't go through life blind. Do the work so you can show up in the world with your eyes wide open.